you are on assignment. Hello and welcome to On Assignment. Today we look back on some of the great reporting we highlighted here in 2012. I'm Philip Alexio sitting in for Imran Siddiqui. And I'm Aru Pandey here for Alex Villarreal. Coming up, Afghanistan's economy is struggling. We'll look at a report we first aired in May. But on a brighter note, business has been returning to Mogadishu as Somali expats respond to improved security in their homeland. In 2012, scientists became much more confident that they have seen the elusive Higgs boson particle. And in Cambodia, the continuing dangerous practice of mining the forests for gold. It's an On Assignment 2012 retrospective, coming your way right now. VOA reporters were in Afghanistan again in 2012, where after a decade of war, many businesses still depend on foreign contracts. But with the looming departure of U.S.-led forces, in addition to security concerns, there's great uncertainty about the country's economic future. Many people in Afghanistan moved their money abroad in 2012, and Bethany Matta reported on the effects of this financial exodus. She talked about that with Imran back in May. Let's take another look, starting with her report. Many truck drivers like Mehrab Gol have made their living delivering flour and cement from neighboring Pakistan and Iran. He says business has been dropping. Pakistan Orders have decreased a lot. We used to drive six rounds of cement in a month from Pakistan. Nowadays we bring three. The truck drivers also complain about payoffs to the police. Official corruption is crippling investor confidence and businessmen are taking their cash and leaving the country. Some 4.5 billion in 2011. During the Taliban and stuff, the economy was, um, it, it wasn't what it is today. Um, but it was certainly like surviving. They were not thriving. Um, and then I believe when the troops had, had come in, they basically pushed a lot of money into the economy. So it, it immediately was jump-started. And when we talk about the, the industries, which are the industries that you, uh, you can pinpoint which are on the rise? I guess right now you can definitely see the ones that are, are failing and they're the ones that have been... Um, that mostly like the property market and stuff like that, they're mostly the ones that the NGOs and the foreigners have invested in. I would say like the telephone companies, um, the mobile phones, the services that people really need here are on the rise. Now, Bethany, when we compare the, the cottage industry or the small industries in Kabul to the poppy industry, if, if people are forced to leave or give up uh, going poppy, does the government have a plan in terms of adjusting them to different industries? I, I think if you ask the government, they, they say they do have a plan. But when you talk to the people and you talk to the farmers, um, they do not follow through with their word. Um, they're not given any seeds. They're not given any money. Um, or if, if they are given alternative crops and stuff like that, they're not making near as much money as they make from poppy. So no, I mean, if you ask the people, it, it's the, the poppy eradication is not working only because the government has not fulfilled their promises. Now, tell me something. What about the business community? In your interactions, do you feel uh, there's some sort, some sort of a fear amongst the business community? Do, are they in favor of the forces leaving or do they want them to stay? How does that unfold? I think you have, you have different perspectives. Basically, what has happened over the past 10 years is that these elite Afghans have they've made money off of ISF. They've made money off of Western development and contracts and stuff like that. So these people are very fearful that, you know, their money is leaving. And, and you, you see that because they're stashing their money in Dubai. People that have invested, though, I think in the local economy with services such as telephones and stuff that are providing the people with, with needs, um, they'll continue on. Now, in terms of uh, in international investment or foreign investment, what about the government's plan in terms of working with other international organizations or corporations to bring in more investment into Afghanistan? Um, I, 
I don't think the government has really had a plan. If you talk to businessmen here, you know, um, that's one of their biggest complaints. One businessman was saying, you know, there's maybe there's five main transport companies and it will be knocked down to two. And what, what, are, what are these people going to do? You know, how are they going to... How are they going to make money? What are you going to do with the extra trucks? What do you, yeah, what's going to happen after 2014? And, and the government really has not provided a plan. What I also wanted to ask you was, what is the experience like in terms of reporting in Kabul and Afghanistan as a female journalist? It's very difficult. Um, as a woman here, and I also feel the same thing when I'm here. Security-wise, it's, it's hard to go out many times. Um, but it's also very interesting because as, as a woman journalist, you're allowed into the homes, which is a wonderful experience because you can really see what normal life is like here. Well, that's an interesting perspective. Thank you so much for your time, Bethany. Uh, Bethany Mata, we are a reporter in Kabul, Afghanistan. Let's go now to Cairo, Aru, where in 2012, a young woman's song captured the imagination of her fellow Egyptians and won an international award. The anti-corruption song went viral with its depiction of a common man who protests against the barriers between the government and citizens. VOA's Elizabeth Errett talked with Alex about that in September. Let's take another look at the story. In a light and lilting voice, she tells the story of a poor man who stands before a wall and pee on the wall and on those who built it. But the lyrics from a poem by her friend Walid Tahir were written in 2005, well before last year's revolution. When Walid wrote it, it, uh, wrote it before, he didn't mean this wall. Of course, it was like more like a philosophy or something. <laughs> And the name of her of her song, the title is The Wall. What's the significance of, of that? What walls is she speaking of? Well, she directly was speaking about some walls that the military rulers had put up in downtown Cairo earlier this year to protect various government ministries. Actually, the, the words, the lyrics to the song were written in 2005 and were about sort of metaphorical walls. Uh, it's a man who comes up to a wall, a poor man, average man, and he comes up to it and he can't do anything against it, so he pees against the wall. And in signifying it also that he's peeing on the people who made those walls and made them so high. So it's barriers and it's sort of a cheeky, nice, light way of, of sort of making a dig at authority. Now, what was interesting, I thought, from your piece is uh, hearing Yusra El Hawari, hearing her say that she really doesn't feel that things have changed much under the new government, even after democratic elections. The military's walls have since fallen, like the old government before it. But even after democratic elections, El Hawari says, other barriers remain. For the government, I see that nothing changed. I don't see that we have more freedom now. Actually, nothing changed. It's still the same, and I, I actually f faced more problems in arts uh, after the, the revolution. Al Hawari lives on a bustling street not far from Cairo's Tahrir Square. In general, she's optimistic, heartened that her fellow Egyptians have been empowered by the revolution. And despite growing concern for women under an Islamist government, she says she's not suffered for not wearing the veil. She thinks that whatever kind of restrictions that might be made on Egyptians, that because of the revolution, that they've really earned their right to say no and to stand up against those kind of bits of, of attempts to abrogate their rights. And so she was, she was upbeat about that. Now, another, you know, great thing about watching her in your piece was seeing her with this accordion, which is not really an instrument that you typically associate with Egypt. There's a freshness to the 29-year-old singer, who's also an actor and a mime a contrast to the pop trends common among her contemporaries. And then there's the accordion. I wanted to play an instrument that I can take anywhere because I was very jealous, like my friends, they can take their, their guitars 
and uh, two trips or something. And I play piano so I can take it anywhere. <laughs> the song went viral, catching the attention of the Fair Play judges in Brazil, where she'll receive her prize in November and take part in a Voices Against Corruption festival. Hers is a political voice, and a strong one, yet light, cheerful, and sly. Elizabeth Errett is VOA's correspondent in Cairo. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we'll revisit our story about the search for the so-called God particle. You're watching On Assignment. Scientists at the European Center for Nuclear Research, or CERN, announced in 2012 the discovery of a subatomic particle that fits the description of the Higgs boson, also known as the God particle. Well, scientists say the development was historic. VOA's Kane Fairball has followed the story, and Alex Villarreal spoke with Kane back in July for some background on the elusive particle. Let's take another look at that story from last year. They now believe they have found what looks like the subatomic particle known as the Higgs boson. It's one of the key missing links to our understanding of really how the universe was created. Kane, why are scientists so excited about this discovery? Well, because they've been looking for this subatomic particle for decades. Uh, in the 1960s, English physicist Peter Higgs developed a theory that there was a subatomic particle uh, which is called the Higgs boson. For me, it's really an incredible thing that it's happened in my lifetime. We have this machine which accelerates protons in two different directions. They slam together, creating 14 trillion electron volts, temperatures and energies not seen since the instant of the Big Bang. The Higgs boson uh, is a particle. It's a ripple in a field which exists throughout space. And that field is the thing that gives particles mass as they move through it. It's one of the key missing links to our understanding of really how the universe was created. And what will be the practical applications of this? Will we see any technological advancements come out of this discovery? Well, it's very interesting. The technological advancements that have come from this discovery in some ways have already happened. While it's not clear yet where the finding will ultimately lead, the technology developed to find the Higgs boson has already produced tangible results, such as the cloud-based digital storage now used by mobile phones and computers. But Roser adds the real benefits are yet to come. Mankind has always asked the question why, and we're one step closer to understanding that. Scientists are calling this a Higgs-like particle, but they're stopping short of saying this is actually the Higgs boson. How long is it going to take us to know if it really is? Some of the scientists that I talk to at Fermilab say it could just be another, another year or two before there's a, a, a full confirmation this is the Higgs boson. What would you have us write today? Have you, have you found the Higgs or what? As a layman, I would say we have it. But as a scientist, I have to say, what do we have? We have something, yeah? We have, a, we have discovered a boson, and now we have to determine what kind of boson it is. What they will do over the course of the next many years is to start to investigate all of its properties to see if it acts, if it smells, tastes, and behaves the way ex they expect it to. Now this has been a very exhaustive, intensive search involving millions, maybe billions of dollars invested in this Hadron Collider and other colliders trying to determine the existence of the Higgs boson. Why have scientists put so much time, money, and energy into this? Well, it's a good question. Uh, it, it is all obviously a multinational effort. Uh, I think there are some somewhere between 15 to 20 countries that have scientists that have been participating in the search for the Higgs. Um, you know, it's not just the Higgs boson. That, that wasn't, that's a goal, but that wasn't the only thing that scientists have been looking for. They've been looking for other particles, other subatomic particles, other things that can't be seen 
you know, with microscopes of the naked eye, and they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, basically what exists at the subatomic level, and they've been able to do that. You know, they've found uh, quarks and other subatomic particles. Uh, but for the most part, this is really trying to get down to the fundamental understanding of what makes everything what it is and how science works. VOA correspondent Kane Fairbot talked with Alex Villarreal in July from Chicago. We're taking another break now, but on the other side, we'll go back to a city on the rebound, Mogadishu. You're watching On Assignment. In Somalia's capital, Mogadishu, the sound of hammers has replaced the sound of bullets. A major business boom took hold there in 2012 as the city enjoyed its longest period of relative peace in 20 years. We had to find out more about this story from our VOA East Africa correspondent Gabe Joslo, Alex Villarreal, speaking with him via Skype in July. Gabe, can you talk to us about this rebirth that Mogadishu is experiencing? Mogadishu is experiencing the first prolonged period of relative peace in the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, this is ever since African Union forces and uh, government-backed militias drove Al-Shabaab militants out of the capital. Uh, and in that time, which has been about the last year or so, uh, a lot of Somali businessmen have returned from, uh, from abroad and other, others have set up shop in, uh, in areas of Mogadishu that were previously completely inaccessible because of the security situation. Business is thriving at the Indian Ocean Star restaurant in Somalia's capital, Mogadishu. Unthinkable a year ago, today the restaurant is serving lobster and fresh fish to a clientele of well-to-do Somalis and expatriates. It is one of a few businesses springing up here in the Lido Beach neighborhood, an area left to ruin during 20 years of war and conflict. So as you drive through the streets of Mogadishu, you're seeing just new life everywhere, uh, literally springing out of the ruins of buildings that were destroyed uh, during all these years of conflict. And, you know, people are able to enjoy a, a somewhat normal life that they weren't able to enjoy before, going to cafes, uh, going to the beach, you know, fancy restaurants have opened up. It's really uh, just a 180 degree turn from the way it was uh, about a year ago. Where is all this money coming from that's fueling this growth? Is it from investors? Is it expatriates? Yeah, it's mostly an expatriate community. I should say a Somali diaspora community. I mean, uh, there's over, over a million Somalis who live abroad who left the country during, uh, you know, the worst years of the conflict. Uh, many of them live in the United States. Other the, uh, others live in Britain, uh, you know, Canada, all over the place, really. Uh, and some of the business owners that are coming back were businessmen in the countries that they had fled to. Mohammed Harid Dagi came back to Mogadishu from London sensing opportunity. We hope Somalis who are overseas or wherever they are in this world will come back. If everyone comes back, we can change things and the young people of this country can be given jobs. The guy who founded Somalia's first commercial bank uh, was running check cashing businesses in Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States. A lot of things called K KYC, know your customers. Uh, and he had saved up enough money and he saw another opportunity because there was a, a complete lack of private banks in the, in the capital. Uh, so he came as well and, and with just a little bit of startup money uh, was able to establish something. And what's giving people confidence, these business owners who are coming and, and starting up, what's giving them confidence that Al-Shabaab won't be returning to Mogadishu? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think there's a, a couple of things. The first is that uh, AMISOM, which is the African Union force, have, have had greater success than they've ever had before uh, against these militants. Uh, and their, uh, in pushing them out of the capital was really a major victory that they weren't able to achieve for, for many, many years. Also, at the same time, Al-Shabaab has lost a lot of support. Uh, they were initially backed because they were the one force that was fighting against Ethiopian invaders. Uh, but when the famine hit last year, um, Al uh, the people of Somalia really turned against Al-Shabaab because uh, they were seen as uh, hindering a lot of aid deliveries and, and really just generally being a hindrance to progress. At the same time, the businesses say that, uh, you know, by coming in and setting up businesses and improving the economy and giving jobs to youths who otherwise would have nothing else to do but join a militia, they're actually creating the conditions for a more sustained peace. Now, Mogadishu, of course, was long referred to as the world's most dangerous city, and you still have the United Nations rating no area of the city lower than high risk. Is it still dangerous now? 
Yes, it definitely is still a dangerous city. I wouldn't want to understate that. The city does feel safer than it was in August uh, when I went there last. You know, we rely on uh, knowledgeable security advisors who know the city and know the country very well. And we do travel with armed guards. The kind of threat that you're worried about is uh, kidnapping, uh, you know, random sort of acts of violence. There have been grenade attacks targeting, especially uh, events that bring out the uh, top Somali officials. The prime minister was targeted at an event at the National Theater. You know, you might be out in the street and the situation looks calm and, and safe, but it can turn very, very quickly. That's Gabe Josselu, our VOA correspondent in Nairobi, talking with Alex Villarreal back in July. Well, now on to another story that we featured back in 2012, where millions of people around the world dig for gold to escape poverty. But many of these mines can be unsafe and pollute the environment with dangerous chemicals. That's right. In Cambodia, small-scale gold mining is a main source of income for thousands of people. Last year, Moni Sai of VOA's Khmer Service traveled to a remote province to meet a few of them and talked about it with On Assignment's Doug Bernard. Here's another look at that segment. This man, who looks like he's trapped in a well, is actually looking for gold. This crude operation typifies the dangers of unregulated small-scale gold mining. Shafts are poorly constructed and ventilated. And the miners wear no protective clothing. On lucky days, we might find almost four grams. On others, barely two grams. On unlucky days, we may only come up with a half a gram. Moni Sai, you began your report uh, at a gold mine in Ratanakiri province in Cambodia. Uh, but to call it a mine seems a bit of a step too far. It, it looked like a giant hole in the ground. Can you tell us, you know, what it is that you saw there? Take us there. In that remote part of the country, um, you see um, uh, several gold mines there. And while you were there, you can see a gold mine as deep as 35 millimeter um, from above the ground. In your report, you talk about the dangers uh, of working in these mines. I think some of them are very obviously, they look uh, rickety to say the best. What are some of the other dangers uh, for the workers down in these gold mines? Right, um, they are taking a great risk, um, I must say, um, um, because, you know, they can be hit by falling rocks um, when they go deep down and they, they, they have to get exposed, you know, to um, mercury and other chemicals which, which um, are used to purify gold. And also, um, in addition to that, they are prone to malaria infection because this is the rainy season here in Cambodia. You know, um, there's a lot of mosquitoes out there. The mercury poses a danger beyond the mining sites as it travels through the air and water. Local environmental and human rights organizations are calling for regulation as well as education. In mining, you get exposed to chemicals that can affect your health. That's why we need mining experts to properly train these miners. So, Moni, what is the government doing, or, or what are private industries doing, um, to help bring some protections uh, for these people, not just in terms of building the mines, but keeping them healthy and keeping these elements like mercury out of the water? Right. Um, so far, actually, these gold mining activities are illegal as um, they are not licensed by the government. You know, but um, rather than regulating these mines, the Cambodian government discourages them and pays more attention to big, you know, to big scale um, mining companies instead. Um, and so um, the environmentalists and local um, rights worker suggest a detailed policy and regulation for this small-scale gold mining activity should be prepared and put in place. That does it for our show for this week. I'm Philip Alexia, but Imran Siddiqui will be back next week. That's right, and I'm Maru Pandey here for Alex Villarreal. To re-watch today's program or any of our past episodes, check us out at voanews.com and on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks for watching On Assignment. We'll see you next time.